I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and my two dogs. But we were four days in, around 20 miles at least as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7k feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when you go to the campsite, there's a, a big open meadow on the top of a secondary mountain. It was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up or make dinner and stuff. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up at this steep tree filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when you see small animals too. Not the excited, oh you guys are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't here, high pitch barks, but sort of unsure or concerned barks. Now, the day before, I'd found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was apparently a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago. And I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb up some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for a moment, before I went to go hang up my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So, while still concerned, I started hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep that I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another five or six step push to the next tree that I could lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making my way up this hill or ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about uh, maybe 100 feet up the hill and I hear a whole lot of big movement about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest and I immediately start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in the matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try and save me. In which case, he's most likely about to die. And I'm just sort of stuck here. If I have to get off this hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below. Like hundreds of 5 to 20 foot boulders as well. So I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. But then I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at the campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after I kind of snap back to it and I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order and call my dog back to me, Loki by the way. He comes and sits against my feet, as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned or stuck there for the moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I try to collect myself. This is when I realized too that I had completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast up to turn my lamp on and I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline pumps going right now. So much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection of the eyes or whatever's up there. I peer up there, I look around, but nothing. But I just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was, it didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far, I guess. I knew something was there. So I'm just kind of steadfast at this point. I need to know what's up here because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone, right? Better to face it now than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill and at one point my dog lunges forward unpinning me. He does like a fake bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this, I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon or sunset. 
My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover, so I'm zeroed in now. I call my dog back and silently watch, and what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about maybe 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camo clothes, but some raggedy sort of hood. It blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew that we were staring right at each other at that moment. So, I stare, before what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know that I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again like she was scared, and I also had to get off that hill before total darkness or I could be seriously hurt or risk dying trying to get back down. So, carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in that direction again just to make it even more clear that I saw him. And eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time that I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking and I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought that she was barking just to sort of bark. Dash hounds do that. Or just barking back at my dog, maybe? But when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling with her tail sticking straight up. Still trying to hold it together, I thought. Okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out? But I was positive that I had zipped it, so the zipper tap or openings was at the very top of the tent door, way out of reach of her. There was no way that she could have done that. In a mixture of being terrified, annoyed, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40 and I fire a single shot into the air as the sun was setting. I climb into my tent without eating, and lay with my gun next to me until first light. And as soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucked too that it was all downhill back there, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time that I made it to the last camp, maybe about four miles from my vehicle, but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around a fire that they'd made and I felt pretty relieved and safe at this point. And they start to tell me that they're planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning. So I tell them my story in detail. And needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning because, well, to heck with that, right? The thing that still creeps me out about this whole day though is that when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike that I was on, other people had had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and even a woman who was found murdered last year. I don't know for sure if these stories are related to my experience, but I just can't help but think that they just might be. A few years back, my now husband and I were living with my mum. My husband had started a new job where he was working 14-hour shifts and wouldn't get home until like 11pm. My brother liked to go out as well, so he also wasn't home. This meant that my mum and I were home alone on Halloween. We lived on a busy street, so we ran out candy around 9pm. My mum put a sign on the door and we went to bed. For some background too, we had five dogs in the house. And at this point, my brother was about 21 years old and I was 22. My brother has a female German Shepherd Husky mix named Coco and she's very good at reading our body language. Our screen door had a large window and it didn't lock and our main door didn't have a view window. In other words, you couldn't really see outside. So the doorbell rings around 11.30pm and I got up instantly and ran to the door. 
I stupidly assumed without a thought that it was my husband coming home from work. I opened the door without thinking and there were two very large people wearing black hoodies and black sweats. I knew the screen door didn't lock so I realized that this was a bad situation. My mum had heard the doorbell as well so she was also walking to the door. My husband had the keys to the house so my mum having good instincts realizing that it wasn't him and decided to come with me to the door. I was stunned to be honest and didn't say anything but my mum comes up from behind me and aggressively says, Can I help you? But before they could even speak, Coco jumped up at the glass and started barking and growling at them. When her paws pushed on the door, it opened slightly and the two people took a step back. They both just said trick or treat and my mum said, Don't you see the sign? We're out of candy. Then the two people walked away. My husband came home maybe 15 minutes later and we told him what happened. Coco for sure saved us from a pretty bad situation. She never acts that aggressively when people come to the door. But anyway, the next morning, we saw on the news a few blocks away that two people that matched the description of the two people that came to our door were shot and killed because they tried to rob the home of an off-duty police officer. The time of the incident was 30 minutes after the two people had come to our door. To better paint the picture, here's a description of myself at the time of this incident three years ago. I'm 5'5", 26 year old woman, medium length bleach blonde hair, curvy, 175 pounds, wearing black high waisted tights and a pink crop top. Three years ago, I was walking home late at night from my friend's house. It was dark and at the time I lived in a rough part of a large city. I've had many sketchy situations that have gotten myself out of, so I guess I felt sort of invincible, like nothing truly scary could happen to me. When I walk alone, I always stay very alert and aware of my surroundings for my own safety just in case. Anyway, about halfway home and roughly 10 minutes to my apartment, I noticed a van starting to tail me. I was used to this since in my city it's very common for a young woman in a rough area to get propositioned for a fun time. It's embarrassing just how desensitized to this I was. But I did my usual and crossed the road so that I'd be walking beside the traffic heading in the other direction. I wasn't scared, just annoyed I guess. The van then turned down a side street then back onto the road that I was on and pulled up to me. At this point, I still wasn't really scared. Again, this has happened so many times and it never mattered if I was wearing something that showed more skin or if I was wearing a winter coat zipped from just below my chin all the way down to my ankles. That area is notorious for that type of activity. I decided to be firm this time and told the person sternly, I'm not interested. I noticed though that there were two men in the van. They looked almost identical and... May have been twins or brothers, I think. In any case, both men had a very dark complexion, dark eyes, short dark hair. The van didn't move and I was super annoyed, sort of crossed the road again to get away. At this point, I figured that this would be enough for them to just stop following me. But they didn't. Instead, they kept circling back every time that I crossed the road. I've never had to put that much effort into getting a, a pervert to leave me alone, so this is when I started feeling unsafe. They zipped by me at the speed of the traffic that was flowing in, and I yelled for them to get lost. I honestly thought that it finally worked too. It had been three minutes, and I hadn't seen the van, so I thought that I was in the clear. Just in case though, I pulled my phone out and was getting ready to call my sister that I lived with, when just then, the van pulled up to me very quickly, and before I could even blink, one of the men jumped out of the van, opened the back door, and approached me quickly in an aggressive manner, as if he was about to scoop me up and throw me into the vehicle. The traffic in that area is very inconsistent. It was dead, and I imagined that this is what they were waiting for. But just as the man was about to place his hands on me, I tilted my phone and said, you're being filmed in my live video chat. I gave my friends your license plate number, and the police have been notified. I was so scared, but I didn't let that show. I stayed as calm as I could, 
The man paused like he was considering if I was bluffing or telling the truth, so I tilted the phone more as if to give the fake audience a better look at him. This seemed to have worked and he jumped into the van and they sped off. I've never been the same since that night. I'm afraid of walking alone now, even in the daytime. Stay safe out there guys and be careful. You never know what could happen to you. I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago by myself and my two dogs. But we were four days in, around 20 miles at least as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around 7k feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So when you go to the campsite, there's a, a big open meadow on the top of a secondary mountain. It was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp as I put the tent up or make dinner and stuff. But I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up at this steep tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when you see small animals too. Not the excited, oh you guys are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't here, high pitch barks, but sort of unsure or concerned barks. Now, the day before, I'd found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was apparently a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago. And I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb up some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for a moment, before I went to go hang up my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So, while still concerned, I started hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep that I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down, before making another five or six step push to the next tree that I could lean against. Anyway... I'm slowly making my way up this hill or ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about uh, maybe 100 feet up the hill and I hear a whole lot of big movement about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest and I immediately start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in the matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try and save me. In which case, he's most likely about to die. And I'm just sort of stuck here. If I have to get off this hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below. Like hundreds of 5 to 20 foot boulders as well. So I'm feeling pretty screwed about now. But then... I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at the campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away, so yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds after, I kind of snap back to it and I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order and call my dog back to me, Loki by the way. He comes and sits against my feet, as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned or stuck there for the moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I try to collect myself. This is when I realized too that I had completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reach up so fast up to turn my lamp on and I basically punch myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline pumps going right now. So much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection of the eyes or whatever's up there. I peer up there, I look around, but nothing. But I just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was, it didn't get away or sound like it had made it too far, I guess. I knew something was there. 
So I'm just kind of steadfast at this point. I need to know what's up here because I have to sleep here tonight. And you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone, right? Better to face it now than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill and at one point my dog lunges forward unpinning me, he does like a fake bluff charge up the hill about 15 feet and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this I finally see movement, something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon or sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover so I'm zeroed in now. I call my dog back and silently watch and what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about maybe 75 feet directly in front of me wearing not camo clothes but some raggedy sort of hood it blended into the environment perfectly. Actually almost like a makeshift ghillie suit but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes and his face was covered in dirt or something but I knew that we were staring right at each other at that moment. So I stare before what seems like minutes. No words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know that I saw him but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again like she was scared, and I also had to get off that hill before total darkness or I could be seriously hurt or risk dying trying to get back down. So, carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in that direction again just to make it even more clear that I saw him. And eventually, I make it down to the boulders at the bottom. By the time that I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking and I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought that she was barking just to sort of bark. Dash hounds do that. Or just barking back at my dog maybe. But when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling with her tail sticking straight up. Still trying to hold it together, I thought. Okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out. But I was positive that I had zipped it, so the zipper tap or openings was at the very top of the tent door, way out of reach of her. There was no way that she could have done that. In a mixture of being terrified, annoyed, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my 40 and I fire a single shot into the air as the sun was setting. I climb into my tent without eating and lay with my gun next to me until first light. And as soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my stuff and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucked too that it was all downhill back there, but I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time that I made it to the last camp, maybe about four miles from my vehicle but thankfully there were other people there. We sat around a fire that they'd made and I felt pretty relieved and safe at this point and they start to tell me that they're planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning. So I tell them my story in detail and needless to say we were both walking back to our cars in the morning because well to heck with that right? The thing that still creeps me out about this whole day though is that when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike that I was on, other people had had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and even a woman who was found murdered last year. I don't know for sure if these stories are related to my experience, but I just can't help but think that they just might be. So I'm a 22 year old female from Hawaii and I live on the more countryside of my island where not even Google Maps can tell you exactly where I live. To put it simple, I live in the boonies and people who don't live by me don't come into my neighborhood unless they're lost. I'm only saying this for context too. 
So, about three days ago, I was in my driveway on my way to catch the bus to work, till a weird catering truck came towards my house and pulled into my driveway. A middle-aged guy came out, wearing a tacky Aloha shirt only tourists would be seen wearing, dirty khaki shorts with run-down sandals. He looked dirty, to say the least, and looked like he hadn't scrubbed in days. He asked me if I wanted to buy meat or seafood and said no thanks, and then asked if anyone was home. I lied and said my uncle was home, hoping that he would go away. But these kind of trucks don't come anywhere on my side of the island, by the way, but anyway, he didn't leave. Then proceeded to compliment my looks, saying how I have nice hair, and going on to say how beautiful island girls are and how our curves are all good and all this sort of stuff. It was creepy, but it wasn't until my neighbor came outside that he drove off. Yet, once I turned the corner, there he was, slowly driving behind me. I felt sketched out and called my mum, who's a dispatcher, and told her what happened and how he looked. She told me that she would handle it, and by the time more people started coming out of the houses, he had left. Two hours later, I was at work, and she tells me that she got a couple of other calls about the same guy with the exact same description as me, and I was asked to go to the station to say if I recognized anyone, and I pointed at his picture. And they confirmed that, apparently... He was a well-known sex trafficker that they hadn't been able to track for like weeks. And to say that I got lucky is an understatement, to say the least. Since then, I've locked my house as soon as my mum leaves for work. I haven't really slept much and have been throwing up or having panic attacks anytime I leave time for myself to think. To be completely blunt, I'm scared and I don't know what to do. He knows where I work, my house, my face, and it scares me to the point that I've even covered up my windows just in case someone might try to look inside. I'm wondering if you guys have any advice about what I should do. So this happened years ago in about 1997 when I was 12 or 13, and I still haven't come up with a good explanation for it. My mum and I had decided to repaint my bedroom at some stage, so this particular day we started by moving all of my furniture into the center of my bedroom, apart from my bed, which we moved in pieces onto the landing outside my bedroom. The bed was a single and it was fairly sturdy, with drawers in it, so heavy too, and there was also a headboard, a mattress and bedding. At the time, we lived in a pretty big Victorian house, I'm in England, and my bedroom was down a long corridor with the other three bedrooms on the opposite side of the house. But for context too, I, I never really liked that house and had bad feelings about it right from when we moved in, when I was like four, and other people said the same over the years too. There were a, a few other, I guess you could call them odd occurrences too, but this one was the weirdest by far. So, that day, we closed my bedroom door and set to painting my walls. This took all afternoon, though we had a break, so we're in and out of my bedroom a couple of times. Once we finished painting, though, my mum had an appointment for a plumber to come around to diagnose a problem with the boiler. He wasn't there long, maybe ten minutes at most, and then we had dinner. It was early evening now, when my mum said that we could probably put all my furniture back into my room and get it ready for me to sleep in that night. However, we moved all the furniture from the middle of my room back into place and then we went to get my bed and it was just gone. But we couldn't work out where it was and probably stood on the corridor outside my bedroom for five minutes discussing whether we were losing our minds or not. And then we set off looking for it, checking other rooms and eventually we found it. In my mum's bedroom of all places, on top of my mum's bed. It was set out exactly as it should be too, with the base the right way up, the mattress on top, the headboard in the right place. The whole thing was built. It was ready to be slept on. Except, obviously, it was on top of my mum's bed in her bedroom. I can still remember the feeling that I had pushing my mum's bedroom door open and seeing it, and just knowing that something really weird had happened. 
I was actually pretty scared and so was my mum, though initially she tried to hide it, saying things like, there has to be an explanation. However, we talked it around endlessly and have done a hundred times since, and we've never come up with an explanation. My mum even called the plumber that night to ask if he'd moved it, and he was really perplexed and said that no, because why would he have done that? And more importantly, how could have he even done it when he was there for like only 10 minutes and was checking something on the boiler the whole time? I should also add that my sister, age 10, was in the house at the time of this incident but was watching films and playing downstairs the whole time. She was also freaked out and started crying which earned me a ban on ever talking about it in front of her ever again. Also, just to be clear, the layout of the house meant the bed had to have been moved along the corridor from my room and then moved around like three corridors to get into my mum's bedroom before being lifted up onto her bed. It was a two-person job for us to move it back and because the base was bulky, I think even someone really strong would have struggled to move it alone. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I feel almost certain that the plumber couldn't have done it and definitely not my sister. One thing I've always wondered though is that at one point the bed moved. I mean, we were in and out of the bedroom all day, but we only noticed it wasn't where it should have been when we went to put it back together. I still have no idea what happened, but when I think about it now, it still freaks me out, man, because there's just no way that that bed should have been where it was. My boyfriend and I moved into a new apartment in May this year and we've been experiencing some really weird things since then. The first thing that I noticed was when I was sleeping in one morning, my boyfriend was already awake playing video games in the living room. I was woken up to a woman's voice that sounded like a very soft and gentle voice but also sounded like a woman was very nervous. It sounded sort of urgent and she just said no over and over again, each no sounding more pronounced. I woke up very confused, obviously, and assumed that my boyfriend had a guest over. It sounded like a disagreement, so I quickly got out of bed and went to see what was wrong. I swear on the way to the living room too, I was still hearing mumbling voices in a conversation. And as I'm sure you've guessed, there was nobody there. When I talked to my boyfriend, he said that there wasn't any voice. His video games were plugged into his headset as well, so it wasn't like it was the TV. I've had experiences with hallucinations when falling asleep or waking up in my younger years. Although it had been years since this last happened, I assumed that it was just that and thought nothing more of it. That was until my boyfriend started experiencing things as well. You see, a couple of nights later, he woke up to the same voice. He described it as an older woman's voice that was soft and gentle, and it said, no, no, don't worry about it, I've got it. It again sounded clear as if he was just having a conversation with someone in the room. This one scares me even more because he said he was waking up but fully awake when he heard it. At first he thought that it was me, but I was still asleep obviously, and he shook me awake because he was so unnerved. But the scariest thing was maybe a couple of weeks after that. My boyfriend had gotten up to pee in the middle of the night and when he came back, I was sitting up and looking at him. Or more accurately, my side of the bed had a figure sitting up looking at him but it wasn't me. It took my boyfriend a moment to realize that he could also see me laying in my normal spot and it was like this figure was sitting up on top of me almost. In other words, somebody else was in my spot too, just staring at my boyfriend. He quickly turned on the light, obviously waking me up, but when he did, the figure vanished. He was really shaken up then too, and I always hear voices and noises when I'm home alone. We've had paranormal experiences in the past, but not like this. We smudged every time something scary happens and things lighten up for a couple of days. 
But considering that there was nothing for the first few months that we lived here, I'm nervous that this might be escalating. I, a 30-year-old female, had just woken up and was getting ready for the day in our bathroom, which is attached to our bedroom. If you look through the door, you have a full view of our bed and my sleeping five-year-old son as well. Now, I saw something adult-sized move past the door in the dark bedroom at regular walking speed, so I opened the door a bit and looked out. There was no one there though and my kid was snoring. My husband should have been at work for two hours at that point. I checked our security cameras and saw nothing but my husband leaving for work earlier. So I chalked it up to anxiety and sleep deprivation as I'm heavily pregnant and can't sleep at all right now basically. Anyway, a few minutes later I heard what sounded like an adult man humming but it only lasted a few seconds. Can't name the tune. I couldn't tell where it was coming from as we sleep with the box fan on full blast right outside the door and I had the exhaust fan on at that time. I looked out the bathroom door again but nothing. Am I going crazy? I uh, took a deep breath and continued washing my face. The door was open about two or three inches and the mirror in our tiny bathroom is one that covers most of the wall from the counter to almost the ceiling. It's big and you can see everything behind and around you and the door is to my left right behind me. You could reach in and tap my shoulder. Matter of the corner of my eye through the mirror, I suddenly saw something that wasn't there before. There was a, a hand reaching through the opening of the door, gripping the door frame right behind me. It looked like a grown man's hand and was at eye level and I instantly froze then turned around half expecting my husband to be playing a prank because who else would be in here with me? But the hand was gone. I even checked through the mirror. Instantly though, my child screamed and I jerked the door open. Nothing there but a scared kid with eyes wide open. He wasn't looking at me though. Who was that? Who baby? I was trying not to sound scared. He stared off into space for a few seconds, then seemingly forgot about whatever happened. He said, Mama, why did you say my name? I said, I didn't, baby. Did you hear your name? You said my name real loud, and then you weren't beside me. I was in the bathroom, and I don't think I did, buddy. It sounded like you. Obviously, I, I checked the cameras. I checked the windows, the doors, every room and closet, shaking the whole time, but... In the end, there was nothing. I feel safer living in this apartment than I ever have anywhere else, which is strange, I know. Even alone, and I've had bad anxiety before. But like I said, if it was only one of us, I would have shrugged it off as sleep deprivation or night terrors, which my kid has never had, or something rational, I suppose. But that just wasn't the case here. So, what did we see? What did we hear? Before I begin this, I would like to provide at least a little bit of backstory. I live in Pennsylvania, and during this particular encounter, I was at my aunt's. She has three kids, and her house is about three or five miles down a remote dirt road off to a, a sort of highway through the rural area. She's approximately 25 minutes away from a store and 35 away from the police station. Oh, and uh, before I start, I understand that I do not usually believe in supernatural things. It was about two or four months ago I was at my aunt's for a birthday party. I got there at around 2 p.m. and by 7 p.m. we were ready to leave. So, my cousins her kids, asked if I would stay over because they don't see me very often. I agreed as I also would enjoy time with them, so after the party and after everyone had left, it was my aunt, her three kids and her husband and I. My aunt and uncle went to bed at around maybe 9.30 or 10 o'clock. I stayed up with the youngest cousin, 
Her name is Amy. Amy and I were in the living room watching some Criminal Minds up until around maybe 11pm. She decided to go to bed and I sort of just stayed up watching the show. Mind you, it's now pitch black outside and I'm in the middle of the woods. For this factor though, they had motion activated lights outside. And as I was watching television on the couch, which was against the window, I noticed that the light outside turns on. My heart is beating seeing it as it's in the middle of the woods and people should not be around the house. So I looked out and it luckily was just a deer about 20 or 30 feet out by the tree line. Since it was only a deer, I went back to watching my show and of course the deer was cute. Nothing to be worried about, right? Well, five minutes pass by and the light shuts off. I'm still watching Criminal Minds. I gather my blankets and pillows to get ready for bed as I was sleeping in the living room that night. As I'm sort of setting up the pillows on the couch and laying the blanket down, a sudden bright flash startled me. It's the motion activated light outside of the living room window. Before I even looked, I thought to myself that it must just be that deer again. However, I looked out again reluctantly, but there was nothing there. At this point, it was like 11.45, almost midnight, and I'm pretty tired and yawning. I go back to organizing my sleep space not even 30 seconds later, I hear something clank the window that I had just observed out of. Once again, I turned to check out what the heck just hit the window. And what I saw, I, I can't even explain rationally. Off to the side by the tree in the yard was the deer again. However, it just wasn't the same deer. It now looked sort of deformed, almost malnourished stomach extremely sunken in and barely any fat on the animal. It just stood there looking straight at me and it felt like it was staring into my soul almost. This deer, if it could even be called a deer, made me feel extremely unsettled and I did not feel safe. And what I saw next made my stomach sink to my feet. This Malnourished deer that made me feel such a foreboding and disturbing feeling, contorted and ran off on two legs. Two. It went into the woods out of my sight, running like a human. By this time, I'm absolutely freaking out. My heart is racing and I'm the only one awake. I immediately closed the curtains, ran to make sure the doors were locked, and I sat away from the window, trying to process what I'd just seen. It was troubling to say the least. No matter how much I thought about it, I just couldn't rationalize what I saw. This deer, literally skin and bone, contorted and folded in ways that are not even capable with normal joint function. The way it ran off on two legs, the way it stared at me before all of it happened. I just... I can't process it. Obviously, I didn't sleep that night. I ended up going to my aunt's bedroom, telling her what I'd seen. She didn't believe me for obvious reasons and told me, you're just so tired you're seeing things. But I can tell you with 100% certainty that I saw what I saw. After that night, I refused to stay at my aunt's anymore and if we would go there for a party, we would made sure that we left before dusk. I've heard other stories from locals in the area from when they were hunting and I remember one mentioning a tribe or a cult that lived in the area off the beaten path. Maybe it was one of them and I was just tired and I don't know, maybe not. If anyone has had anything similar then please do let me know because I feel crazy about this and I can't find anything similar. I can't even talk about it to people because they think I'm crazy or on drugs or something. So it was my birthday and I was with my best friend at her friend's house in an apartment building. But just your average party I guess. We're all drinking, hanging out, blasting music... My friend's friend introduces me to a guy at the party. I think his name was Ed, but I'm not completely sure. 
I talk to him a bit though and go and mingle, but an hour later he finds me and starts talking to me again. He's an openly gay guy. I want to say in his late 20s maybe. I was maybe 19 at the time. But I talk to him again. He's really nice and all, but just has a slight edge of sort of loneliness to him, I guess. We talk again. Again, I go and mingle. 2am hits. Party winds down. My friend and I are heading out the door and my friend says to me, I'm starving. Let's go to the 7-Eleven. Ed hears this and says, it's only two. Don't go home yet. Come up to my apartment and chill and I'll make you guys some food. It seemed like a, a reasonable offer to be honest. The fact that he was obviously gay made us both feel that we were in no danger. We go upstairs and chill on his couch, watch TV while he makes us hot dogs and mac and cheese and stuff. We eat and talk to him and maybe 45 minutes to an hour goes by. It's around 3am, really is time to go home at this point. So I say, oh, thanks a lot for the food, man. It was great, but we really should go. And my friend stands up too. What? Are you kidding? He says. You just got here. I've got dessert too. Just hang for a bit. I've got blankets if you want to sleep here on the couch. It's late to be walking around. I hear that tone in his voice again. That sort of sense of loneliness. This time tinged with desperation. I didn't feel uh, any danger, I just sort of felt sad for him, I guess. He seemed a bit lost. Sorry, but we really can't, I said. I walked towards the door and he hesitated like he was going to say something and then just shrugged and gave me a hug and my friend. We left the apartment and went home. About three months later, I was watching the news one night and... I see his face and apparently he was arrested for murder. He invited a guy to his place and when the guy tried to leave, he allegedly freaked out and killed this dude. I still wonder if we were actually in any danger that night. I can't lie, I felt no danger at the time. I never felt like he was weird or off, just a lonely, slightly awkward sort of person, but perfectly nice dude. To be honest, it really freaked me out a bit, and that feeling lasted for quite some time. Just the thought that I could be in a room with someone capable of something like this, someone having issues and close to losing it, and literally have no idea, it scares me. So, I work nights as a security guard at a casino. The place never closes and is always full of people, so I guess I just never expected anything spooky to happen. A part of a security's job is carting people, so one of us has to be at each entrance at all times. One of the entrances is for valet, but since our valet is closed due to the pandemic, hardly anyone comes in that door, especially during my shift. It was my turn too to spend an hour at that door from 4 to 5 a.m. this past Tuesday. It was my Friday and I get off at 6 a.m. so I was pacing back and forth and looking at stuff in the window of the gift shop just waiting to be relieved. Only three people had left out that door since I'd been there so I was standing at the carting podium just staring down at my schedule to see who was coming to relieve me. When I heard someone say good morning and honestly... That kind of spooked me because I wasn't expecting anyone to be honest. I looked up real quickly to see an older guy walking towards the podium. I said good morning back and looked back down to take my mask off of my badge where I'd hung it and put it back on and all that. But when I looked up again, he was just gone. I thought that he just walked right past me so I turned to look down the hallway heading to the casino floor but... There wasn't anyone but table game dealers coming back from break out of the employee door further down the hallway. I basically just sort of spun around in a circle looking for this guy. I mean, there just wasn't anywhere else for him to go. There's escalators behind me that go up to the event venue and the closed gift shop next to me. I walked out of the first set of doors to look if he went back outside and... Well, there wasn't anyone out there either. 
Now, I wasn't even thinking about anything paranormal had happened, so I just picked up the phone and dialed surveillance to ask them where that guy went, and if he got past me because we're supposed to cart everyone regardless of age. But they told me that no one had even come in according to the cameras. This is a casino and the cameras cover every inch of the place in Ultra HD and apparently they didn't see anyone. They saw me look up like someone was there, turn to look down the hallway, then walk through the doors and look outside and all that. But apart from that, there was nothing. In the end, I just thanked him for checking and hung up thoroughly confused. I don't even know what I would call this ghost encounter. It was just weird. The guy looked totally normal, just an older man, looked like he was in his maybe 60s, white guy with a Chicago Bears hat, he was wearing a blue polo shirt and jeans as well. I don't know if I was just really tired and seeing things or what the heck happened, but now I'm going to feel weird about being put at valet entrance that late in my shift from now on I suppose. Anyway, I don't know what happened that night, but... Wish me luck with my next shift because it's coming up soon. This kind of mess up always happens in the worst situations. I get nervous, act stupidly and the world blesses me with mercy every time. This time around I was at home, pretty unusual for me. The last days I'd been sick and stayed home from school, and that Friday I was fully recovered but decided to skip classes anyways because it was the end of the week and it just wasn't worth the trip. A little bit of background too, both of my parents were out, but my father had late shifts and my mother was taking care of an elder so she had to sleep at her house. We have like wooden slab sort of thing that close on the windows and doors for the heavy weather that has also closed at night for avoiding people to look inside through the curtains that are very transparent mind you, especially at night when the only light source is inside the house. But my parents used to open them when they were home during the day to make the environment naturally illuminated but I spent all day in my room like a goblin so I never did. The only one opened was the one that my parents left open for getting out of the house. This is an important detail too, so keep it in mind. Now, at some point I noticed a grey car parked across the road on the specific times of the day. They simply parked, stayed a while, and then drove off. I figured that it must have been some of my neighbours' visitors since they didn't have a place for more cars, so sometimes their friends park on the bus stop. And one day I was cutting myself some tomatoes for a sandwich when I heard a loud bang at the glass door. I quickly turned at where the sound was coming from and spotted a, a man that was throwing himself against the door with his whole body weight. I tell you that that door isn't made to hold any kind of trauma. It was a full panel of glass as fragile as it may sound. Many people broke it by mistake during parties and stuff and I was totally sure looking at the shaky nails that it wouldn't have lasted another two bangs. My mind at this point dropped to a caveman level and I decided to open the door with a table knife in my hand, a rounded table knife mind you. The man fell before my feet and I collected myself with the most sufficient expression that I could give. I didn't say a word, I just stared at him as he quickly got up and backed off. He then proceeded to make up just the messiest explanation that I've ever heard. He said something like, oh I didn't know you were home and then asked me if my parents were home because he had a service for sharpening knives. That is a thing here, people do go around streets and stop home by home for various services but knife sharpening service? That was a new one. He then looked quickly at my hand and responded to himself that we didn't need any sharpening and he had made a mistake. I then saw a woman coming out of the corner and following him to come into the house before noticing me the man turned and shook his head seriously with eyes wide open. She backed off too and they quickly ran to their car from which, unfortunately, I didn't get the plate. Honestly, I don't even think I could have seen it from that far. I then closed the wooden slabs, shut the door and proceeded eating my unfinished sandwich with shaking hands.
So I used to work in a museum a couple of years ago. It was an open air museum that consists of old houses that were transported from all over the country and placed in one spot. I switched between the spots that I worked in, but one of the places that I frequently worked in was one of the most remote spots, which was a little city town made out of sort of tall buildings from Europe around the 14th and 16th century. Again, these buildings are originals and they have been transported stone by stone to this spot and rebuilt exactly. So, here's my story. Now, I usually was the first one to arrive in the morning which meant that I opened up the buildings and switched on the lights and stuff like that. But me being often too lazy before my first cup of coffee, usually walked around in the dark to go grab my coffee and go to the toilet first. The toilets were on the second floor and our little kitchen was sort of hidden on the third floor. And oftentimes when I was at the toilets, I would hear footsteps on the stairs and then on the third floor. It's all made out of old wood so they creaked a lot me thinking it was probably the cleaning lady arriving, I head towards the third floor and open the door, only to find it empty and still dark. I'm not easily scared though, so I just sort of shrugged it off and made my coffee and went back downstairs to open for the day. But my other colleague arrives about half an hour later and I ask her about it, and she confirmed that I was the first and only one there that morning. Every time I heard the footsteps then, when I was alone in the morning, I just sort of cheerfully greeted my fellow ghost on his way to coffee. As for my second story, this takes place in the same spot, however, not in the same building. So during the day I worked in the museum shop in an old city part, and usually it's pretty busy, so I didn't get much time to do anything else, but on days that it rained extremely hard, nobody would ever venture far enough into the park to come as far as the old city part. So on one of those days, when I was extremely bored, I decided to explore the building a bit. This one also consisted out of three floors. The ground floor was the shop, the first floor was storage, and the second and third floors were supposedly empty. Me being curious by nature wanted to see it, so I went up the first floor and walked up to the door that is the entryway to the stairs to the second floor. The doors are really old, so the only lock on them are these little sort of wooden pieces that you have to slide up, which I did. But as I pulled to open the door, which did open by the way, it suddenly was roughly pulled back closed. Which was really strange because there was no draft of wind whatsoever. To be honest, I thought somebody was maybe on the other side, but all the doors were closed, all the windows too, and I didn't feel or hear any wind or anything so I tried again and it was pulled closed again. By this time I was like okay clearly something doesn't want me to go in there so I'll just leave it be. And that's what I did. I went back downstairs and I left it. But later I asked my other colleague about it asking if he ever went up there and if the door was maybe locked or something. To be honest, I was so shocked by it that I thought that maybe I just imagined opening it. But he confirmed to me that it was never locked. He also said that nobody ever really went up there since one of the guards had tried to take their own life up there or something. I hadn't heard about that before, but I told my colleague about what happened to me that day. And he looked very spooked. Because apparently, he'd been hearing footsteps as well up there. Anyway, those were the few experiences that I had while I was working in that museum. Obviously, I don't work there anymore, but I hope you enjoyed them. This happened about 12 years ago, but I remember it vividly. I was waiting at the Orlando airport for my mum to fly in for vacation to see me, my daughter, she was a year at the time and my then fiancé were there too. Her plane had been delayed due to weather and it was getting later and later. When finally the airport was almost empty and it was pretty much midnight, I needed to use the restroom and told my fiancé to hang onto my daughter's stroller as he was falling asleep. I was not tired, I was actually pretty excited to see my mum and I had drank a few coffees by this point. So I went into the women's room and every stall door was open. I chose a random one and used it. All the while it was completely silent in there. 
I left the stall and was washing my hands. The bathroom had a mirror that went all the way across the wall and I didn't see anything. But while I was washing my hands, I got a really weird feeling. I had been looking down at my hands the whole time and I looked up and all of a sudden there was a scary looking woman standing right behind me, almost touching me, leaning right into me. We sort of made eye contact in the mirror and she said, Jesus loves you, do you know that? In a really freaky way too. Obviously I was really freaked out by that and just sort of nodded while staring at her in the mirror. She then walked away and I couldn't see if she left the bathroom or not due to the design of the exit, but I was shaking over the exchange because of the tone she used, it was almost like she was saying that Jesus saved me from her doing something awful to me. I never heard her come in, mind you, and I'm a pretty paranoid person, so I pay attention to listening for people and things. Plus, those bathrooms echo so much, I definitely would have heard footsteps. I also never saw her hands, so I really don't know if she had a weapon or not, but maybe she did? Either way, I timidly left the bathroom and my fiancé was standing near the bathroom holding my daughter. I asked him if he saw that lady and he had no idea who I was talking about. I looked around the area though and it was completely empty, just us in there. I don't know where she went or whatever happened to that woman, but that face will forever haunt me as long as I live. So do you guys know those silly school trips that last a few days? Well, well, I used to go on as many of those as I could because I loved them at the time. It was always so much fun to choose your roommates and decide who went on what bed and stuff like that. And I must have been maybe 12 or 13 at the time of this story. Everyone else involved being around the same age too. But this school trip was meant to be like any other as well. It was for my English class and it was about a certain author that we were studying at the time. The day started ordinarily too. Well, we got off of the couch and went up to our designated rooms. In the room was a shower and a toilet and four bunk beds. But one was closer to the door and the second was parallel to it on the opposite side of the room. I was on the bottom bunk and my friend Rosa was on the bunk on top of me. And my other friends, Eloise and Noel, they were on the other bunks. Eloise being on the bottom and Noel was on the top. Now, to get into our room, you had to go up two flights of stairs and sort of into a little foyer area. And from there, you had a door directly to the left of the foyer entrance door. You go through that door and there were two more doors, well, one to the left and one straight forward. The one directly in front was our door. It's important to note too that some friends of ours were in the room to the left. We were also allowed to go out into small groups into the village or the town area as long as we told a teacher. I remember my room and the room next to us too went out to grab some snacks and food as we would not be having food until the next morning so we wanted something. As our room was bigger we all went in there to enjoy our masterful feast and it must have been around maybe 6pm I would guess but maybe a little later. Our school was very friendly, everyone knew pretty much everyone so we would have a set time that we would all go down and talk, socialize, play snooker, watch the Love Island, with subtitles of course, or just generally chill out. Our teachers would join in too and it was a lot of fun. We would usually go up to our rooms around 10 or 11 p.m. and that night we went up at about 10. My roommates and I stayed up for a while just sort of talking and sharing sweets around. The rooms next to ours didn't have a toilet and they were worried about what they would do so we decided that instead of being smart and just giving them our room key and taking it back in the morning that we would keep the door unlocked for them. And I'm pretty sure that I fell asleep at around midnight after everyone else had fallen asleep. At some point though I woke up shortly after, completely naked mind you and half asleep as well but I'm a light sleeper so when I heard the door click shut... I immediately woke up. At first I sort of assumed that it was one of the girls next door coming in to use the toilet but it wasn't. I 
heard a sort of low grunting or panting sound, which confused my little asleep brain to no end, but I concluded that it was one of the male teachers who just forgot to check up on everyone. It's not that uncommon to be honest, but what I didn't expect was the dude to come over and sit down on the edge of my bed, as if he was getting ready to get in. He sat on my foot, and I guess that he felt it because he stood back up, and put his hands on the end bars of the ladders on both of the bunks, I assume trying to stay standing up. For some reason, I still thought that it was a teacher, but I was starting to wake up a little bit at this point, starting to take in the situation. I heard him say, this isn't my room, it's a room with girls in it. And I just replied, uh, yeah, it is. But it was weird, because it wasn't a question, and he didn't sound confused or embarrassed. He stated that he was in a room full of young girls, and he knew that he was there. I'm pretty sure that he purposely looked for a girl's room too, but he also didn't speak like a normal human being. Looking back, why on earth I wasn't freaked out by this point, I have no idea. Know too that this is only the first night, and a lot of crazy things happened on that trip some of which are going to haunt me forever, and always lock your doors no matter what. Be smart and be safe, and remember, if something happens to you, especially if someone does something to you, it's never your fault, and you're not alone. But anyway, I heard slight shuffling and the door clicked shut again, and that's when it clicked for me that there was an unknown man in our room, and I had just talked to him. Well, I bolted up into a sitting position and quietly slipped out of bed, grabbing our room key off the coat hook that we put it on. And then, I saw legs. I would have screamed if I wasn't so stunned, scared and tired, but I scrambled back into my bed. That's when Rosa woke up. She was incredibly tired and I was on the verge of panic attack. She was incredibly tired, but I was on the verge of a panic attack. I got up off of my bed so she could see and just pointed at the legs when she saw them and she went wide-eyed and looked like she was about to join me in my panic attack. We started whispering trying to figure out what to do next but then Noelle woke up asking us to be quiet as she was trying to sleep so Rosa broke the news that we probably wouldn't be sleeping properly at all that night. Noelle didn't believe us at first so I tiptoed over to her and showed her the legs and then it hit both of us that he was completely naked. There was a naked, unconscious for all we knew, man in our room, just in front of our door, blocking our only escape route from this room. And so far, it wasn't looking too great. I went over to Eloise and shook her awake. She scared us half to death with how loud she sounded, but... We were terrified that this man had come into our room with bad intentions and was either pretending to be unconscious so that we would go near him, or that he somehow managed to knock himself out, but if we went near him that he might awaken. I got Eloise to calm down and Rosa once again explained as I started to break down. The other girls were close behind me and both in distress. It was at this point that we got our phones and we started calling every friend and contact that was on the trip with us, desperately hoping that they were awake so that they would come and save us. But sometimes, you just have to be your own hero. We were trying to stay calm and figure out a plan when Noelle was able to reach her dad on the phone. He gave us some advice about how to handle the situation, but ultimately told us to get out and find someone to help us now. Remember though that this man was in the entryway and blocking the door with his head and it honestly felt like we were trapped but in the end we decided that we just had to do it. If it went wrong then we would just hit him on the head with the door and it was that simple. Noel went first followed by Eloise then me and then Rosa. The door was only open a crack so we had to move quickly and quietly trying to fit through the crack as best as we could. Otherwise, we ran the risk of hitting him and waking him up. I'm fairly certain, too, that Rosa actually hit this guy on the head just to spite him, and I wish that I had the confidence to do that, but I didn't. We went through both of the doors and out into the open space of the foyer area. At the left end of the area was one of the male teacher's rooms, and I remember frantically knocking on that door, 
still being careful not to wake the man or anyone else up, but no teacher ever answered. So we kind of just stood there in the middle of the open area, freaking out, crying ourselves a river. Looking back, I kind of feel stupid, but we can't change the past, right? But then, all of the teachers on the trip came out of a corridor, talking quietly. Obviously seeing us sobbing, seeing me and Noel collapsed on the floor in a breakdown, was not what they had expected to see that night. And apparently, the man had been walking around most of the rooms, trying the door handles, knocking on the doors, just trying to get in. My male teachers had caught him and taken him downstairs, and at that point... He had a bedrobe on apparently, but the teachers had gone to one of their rooms to figure out what they should do next. Since we were underage and part of a school, they had to call the police. We had to stay up and wait for the police to arrive and we had to go to a separate area where the female teacher's room was and calm down over there. Can I say too that the lady who told us to be quiet because she and her husband wanted to spend some quality time together and we were just disturbing their peace? Screw you. We were traumatized 12 year olds. I mean, come on. When the police did eventually arrive though, they took the man downstairs and we were asked some questions and we asked questions in return. And the police told us that apparently the man wasn't drunk, he wasn't on drugs either, and he honestly had no reason to be there. They had no idea what his intentions were or what he was doing that night, but he was kicked out of the hotel and was apparently never allowed back there but I guess that that's the creepiest part because we assumed for so long that he was either drunk or on drugs or something but no apparently he wasn't so what was he doing just laying there in that hallway making it almost impossible for us to escape like that to this day I still don't know what that guy was up to but I have a feeling that it was no good. So this happened in 2011. For some reason too, I, I can't get a direct link to the story because the local news website isn't working, or at least the article about it isn't working. Or maybe it's broken or deleted or something. There is some mention of it online and you can find people talking about it on forums and linking to the article, which appears to be broken or deleted too. So before people start calling me out for not providing a source, just google body found at James A. Reed and you'll find what I'm talking about. So I live really close to James A. Reed. It's a little memorial wildlife area of a little over 3,000 acres. It's a popular location for fishing because it has something like 12 small lakes. I consider them large ponds really, but semantics. It has hiking as there are numerous hiking trails that traverse the entire area, all of which are pretty much light hiking or sort of nature walking sort of trails. It's a popular spot for photographers for shooting portraits, and during hunting season it's popular for bow hunting too. I personally am an amateur photographer I guess, but... I do portraits for a sort of side gig. I like to fish too, and I also like to go hiking. And so it's basically one of my favorite places, and I go there really often. I got into portrait photography by shooting school photos and couples and such at this location too. It has fields with tall grass, great colors in the fall, docks, and easily accessible changes in scenery. It's basically a photography goldmine. I still do photography, but I'm quite a bit better known at this point, and obviously significantly better than I was then. But I still use James A. Reed as my go-to location for almost everything. Boy Scout troops also go hiking through the area on nature walks and such. It's a very popular area, in fact. In the summer of 2011, though, the body of a 19-year-old guy was found at the wildlife park. They call it a wildlife park, but... I mean, the wildlife amounts to deer, fish, lots of snakes, squirrels, and cranes. I've never really seen anything else there, and I've been there more times than I could ever really count, I think. Anyway, uh, the story of uh, this kid's body was a minor new story, but since I was so familiar with this area, it was of interest to me. But the news report was immediately confusing. You see, according to the report... 
The kid had been partying with some friends and he'd OD'd at the party and the story breaks apart here because his friends say that he wandered off and they didn't know where he went. His mother thinks, for no clear reason, and this is the operating story that the news went with, that he OD'd at this party and his friends dumped his body in the wildlife area in the middle of the night. But both of these things are pretty much impossible and I'll explain exactly why. So the article mentioned which lake this body was found near. It was Bodark Lake, which is pretty much the farthest lake from the entrance to the park that you can get to. And getting to this particular lake requires driving down about a mile and a half long paved road that hasn't had any service in like at least two decades. This thing is riddled with potholes that are car killers in fact. If you don't know where they are too, you have to take the road slow because hitting one of these things in anything short of a full-size pickup will likely destroy your tire and wheel. I've driven it so many times that I have the potholes memorized now and can drive it pretty normally, weaving in and out of them when they come up. But in the dark of night, this would be really tricky, especially for some drunk and high teenagers. But that in and of itself isn't impossible to do, I suppose. But there are three gates between the entrance and where this body was allegedly found. One right at the driveway leading into the park, which is one of the large swinging steel gates. The next gate is just after that one. And in order to get to Bodark, you need to make an immediate right-hand turn after the visitor center. And that is where you run into the 10-foot tall chain link fence that's meant to keep the deer in the wildlife area. This fence runs the entire perimeter of the reserve as it's right off of a highway, and they want to make sure the deer stay there for hunting season. You need to get through a second chain link fence gate that's chained shut every night too. The park opens at sunrise and closes at sunset. And after you go through that gate, you get on the previously mentioned paved road for about three minutes and come to what they constitute as the ranger station. But it's really just a, a big parking lot pretty much. From there, there's another giant fence gate that is chained shut at night. After you're through that gate, you're in the clear to get to Bodark Lake. Now, the trail near Bodark Lake is particularly scenic, and I've used it countless times for photo shoots. It's also a good walk through nature, so the next day my girlfriend and I decided that we should go and check it out, see if we could find where they found the body. I know, it's a bit disrespectful, but we really were going to go there anyway, so why not, right? Well... We did find where they found the body. We know this because the police tape was still there, but man, it was one heck of a chore. In order to get where the body was found, you had to start on the trail near Bodark, but about five minutes into the walk, go completely off the path and go through the trees and brush down an extremely steep slope that goes downward about 20 feet and cross the stream at the bottom. The stream was about three to four feet deep as it was running high though the water doesn't move very fast. And the only reason that we knew where we were going was because the original trail was high enough up that, through the trees, we caught the glint of the yellow caution tape way in the distance. When hiking, we both wore a pair of Vibram hiking shoes that didn't have trouble with water. Yes, the ones with the weird toes. But the water was still deep, and we didn't particularly want to go swimming, so we walked upstream for quite a while until we found a section that was thin enough to jump across. Mind you, we walked upstream about 10 minutes before we found this, and then walked back down the stream to where we had been to continue in the direction of the caution tape, which we could no longer see now that we were on level with it. After a few more minutes of sort of trudging through particularly thick brush and forestry, we finally arrived at the second stream, on the other side of which was the roped-off area of police tape. The actual taped off area was pretty small so we were able to tell pretty much exactly where the body was found. It was on a pile of rocks right on the other side of the stream. We didn't cross this stream because, well, we found it and I guess that was good enough. I mean, there was really nothing else to see. And we'd gone from a class 0 nature walk to a class 2 and at times class 3 hike to even get here. And that really got me thinking too because there was just absolutely zero possibility of any drunken teenagers carrying a human body this far into the wilderness in the middle of the night. And this is after they bypassed the three gates 
which were never reported to have been broken into at all. This kid was way off the beaten path and was very literally in the middle of the wilderness. It was so remote, in fact, that his body was there for at least a couple of days before anyone found it. Now, I've done a lot of hiking and even completely sober in the middle of the day. This was a real challenge to get to. It's equally impossible that he just wandered away from some party in the middle of the night and just found himself here. I mean, there are houses along the highway across from James A. Reed, most of which are farms, and if you go a couple of miles down the highway, you do find a residential area. But the notion that he got messed up, wandered miles down the road, hopped two ten-foot fences, walked a mile down a barely paved road, went into the forest, crossed two deep streams, sat down on a pile of rocks, and decided to OD in the middle of the forest, is equally, if not more unlikely. So I guess the question is, what happened to him? I don't know, but... I think it's a lot more likely that they went into the forest during operating hours and all started doing something in the middle of the forest and they left him where he died. But still, this is a massive stretch and I cannot stress to you the difficulty of getting to this location. Anyway, why am I telling this story? I mean, it just sounds like some really shoddy police work, right? I'm getting there though. Hang with me. So, we started our retreat back to the actual trail, climbing through the trees and the brush, which was now significantly more difficult because we were going uphill, back to the first stream, and after that it was a steep incline, which was definitely going to require grabbing trees and getting firm footholds, and a bit of teamwork too. But before we got that far, we had to track back upstream to get to the point where we could jump across it. And right here is where it got really weird. So... As we're following the stream up, we stopped dead in our tracks because a middle-aged man in a full business suit was just walking in the stream. He was a tall guy. The water came up right around his chest. He was in a white dress shirt, a black blazer, black tie, and he had a briefcase in his hand that he was kind of letting float behind him. He was walking downstream, so coming directly towards us, but paid us no mind. We both just sort of stopped and stared at this guy, and then at each other as if to silently say, what the heck? And both of us backed up as he got closer to us. He passed us by without saying anything or even looking in our direction. He was bald, white, probably around 45 years old I'd say, and fairly broad. He had a completely blank expression on his face, and he honestly looked like he hadn't slept in days. What I mean is that he had massive bags under his eyes, which were just completely dead, for a lack of a better term. His expression was just dead. Like, slightly slack-jawed and eyes glossed over. It's worth noting, too, that he was dry from the chest up, like he had just entered the water and started walking downstream. He was just walking straight down the stream, too, very slowly. And we just sort of stood there completely silent, staring at this guy until he passed us by, and we were now looking at the back of his head as he marched forward. Mind you, he definitely could have easily exited the water at any point here. The embankment wasn't difficult, but he just sort of soldiered on down the stream. We now moved away faster than we safely should have, I admit, running up the stream to jump across and get back on the trail and to our car, where... But we drove off and both immediately started asking each other what the heck that was. We tried to tell our friends about this experience, but it was beyond even really conveying how weird this was. It's even hard telling it here like this. It was just dead silent in the forest too, or at least it seemed that way. All we heard was him sloshing through the water as he slowly made his way downstream to wherever he was going. To be honest too, I sort of expected to read about another body being found, like this guy was off to hang himself in the forest or something, but no such news articles ever appeared. But the vibe that he gave off, like, man, I really can't explain the feeling that seeing this guy gave us. It was like overwhelming dread, confusion, and I'm sure some terror too. I really don't know how to explain the emotions that we were feeling, 
and we both agreed that we didn't even have words for it, but it was totally a foreign feeling. Anyway, I'm asking all of you guys out of curiosity, what do you guys think we came across out there? I know I probably didn't need all the backstory, but it's a weird case that locals generally feel was not sufficiently answered, because anyone familiar with the area and location will tell you exactly what I just did, that both accounts of how he got there are just basically impossible. So, were the body and the businessman in the river related, or did he just stumble upon something else while out looking for the location? Who or possibly even what do you think this dude was? I want to tell you that it was just a guy randomly walking down a stream of disgusting murky water in a business suit, because, let's be honest, weirder things have happened, but I just can't shake the feeling that this guy gave off. I don't know. What do you guys think? I was driving through eastern Washington on some state roads. There was no rest stops or cities, but I had done the route enough to know where there were massive dirt areas every like 40 miles where you could park safely away from the road and take a rest. I decided to call it a night and close my blinds and laid down to watch something on my phone. After roughly an hour, I hear someone try to pry open the driver's side door. I haven't heard any vehicles on the road the whole time that I'm parked, but I get up and peek out of the curtains. As I'm looking out into the blackness of the driver's side window, I hear them try the passenger side door. I peek down from the top of the curtain, but can't see anything, so I start the truck and I kick on the lights. I'm fairly freaked out at this point, so I'm still not opening the curtains, but peeking through the gaps. There's nothing, though. Nobody is standing near either of my doors or parked with sightline. I take a deep breath and close the sleeper curtains too, because for some reason that's going to make things better, right? Anyway, after laying back down and convincing myself that something must have blown against the truck and it only sounded like the doors, it was fairly windy outside and a lot of flat ground. I hear what sounds like someone trying to pry open the vents on the sleeper. The door handles start clicking again, and the truck starts shifting like somebody is climbing on it. I hit the little alarm button in the sleeper hoping to spook them off, but it does nothing but add to the noise of the door handles. Then there were fingers tapping on the windows in the chassis, and finally, the hiss of the air coming out of the suspension. And then, all of a sudden, it just stops. There's a few moments where I can only hear myself breathing and my heart pounding before I hear another truck approach and then drive by. I spent the next few hours waiting for whatever it was to come back, but it never did. In the morning, I couldn't find any footprints or damage to my truck, but on every single window, there were these tiny human-looking handprints, almost like a toddler had licked their hands and stuck it to my window over and over again. I'm not sure what was out there that night, but man, am I glad that my truck withstood the test. Around 2006-ish, I was driving flatbed, picked up a load of construction material, drywall, roofing. Don't remember really, but it was pre-packaged in boxes, and I remember having to use strap protectors on the load in rural Tennessee. My memory is foggy now, but I want to say that it was between Memphis and Nashville, but closer to the intersections of the MSALTN state lines. Anyway, tarp required, so I strapped everything down, tarped the load, and left the shipper. About five miles down the road, in the middle of nowhere, woods on a two-lane road, I noticed my tarp flapping in the wind. I found a wide shoulder, and I pulled over to fix it. I realized pretty quickly too that I just flat out did a terrible job tarping this load and decided to just redo the whole thing on the side of the road. So I undo all the bungee straps, drag the tops off, roll them back up, climb up on the load and start unrolling the tops again. And I see a 
guy walking down the road, same side of the road that I'm on, coming towards my truck. I don't really think anything of it, other than to keep an eye on him because, well, I'm in the middle of nowhere, and I just continue what I'm doing. About the time that I have the tarp set in place and am climbing down to start hooking the bungee straps back on, this dude is getting pretty close now, enough so that I'm now paying more attention to him than I am to tarping my load. I grab my winch bar and set it on the trailer where I'm working, just in case. It's an 8 pound solid metal bar about 4 feet long, tapered to a blunt end on one end and it's also hollow on the other. It's used for tightening straps and chains and stuff like that. So the guy gets to me and the first thing that I notice is his hair. It's like a mullet, but it's sort of really patchy. Like he tried to cut his own hair or something and maybe had a seizure in the process and said, eh, good enough to party. The next thing I noticed though were his eyes, which I can only describe as just off. Like they were clear. I didn't think that he was drunk or high or anything, but it also just gave me the distinct impression that the elevator just didn't go all the way up there. His clothes were dirty and not well maintained, with dirty white tennis shoes. And I remember this because he didn't have laces on one shoe and the tongue was noticeably out of place too. He stops by me, waits until I acknowledge him and just says, I've got a long walk. I'm like, uh, yeah man, you do you, we're in the middle of nowhere making it clear that there's no ride to be had here. He nods though, starts walking by me, continuing on his way, stops at about the driver door on my truck and turns around, comes back to me and repeats himself. I've got a long walk, he says. At this point, I explain that I just can't give him a ride, insurance and all that, apologize for not being able to help him out, and he seems to accept this, turns around and he leaves. I wait for him to get a little ways away from my truck and I start working on finishing the tarp job. I still keep an eye on him of course and he's moving away from me now. And as I'm putting on the last of the bungee straps I just look over to check where he's at and he's turned around heading back towards me again. Now about a hundred yards in front of my truck and coming back my way. It looks like he's maybe talking on a cell phone. He has his hand to his face and I can barely make out his mouth moving. His other hand is waving like he's having a conversation with someone, but I finish with the straps, grab my winch bar, and am climbing into my truck as he's about 10 yards away now. And as soon as I'm in the cab, I lock the doors immediately and set the winch bar on the passenger seat just in case. I look at the guy and realize that he's not talking on a phone. He's talking to his hand and now I'm beginning to get a bit nervous because he doesn't look like he's having a nice pleasant chat. Instead, it looks more like an angry conversation. Either way, I crank the truck up to put it into gear and just pull out and didn't look for traffic or anything. As I pass him, he's just looking at me, still holding his hand to his face with a dead look and just staring at me. It gave me the creeps and about the time that I hit 5th or 6th gear I look in the mirror and all of a sudden there's just nobody there. So to start off, this happened around 6 years ago. I was 13 and my friends and I, we decided to hit up the local haunted maze for Halloween one year. We saved up for the tickets which was somewhere around $20 each. Then we set out the day before Halloween. Now, there were three of us in total, and we waited in line for over an hour to get on the ride to take us to the maze, which was about 30 minutes away from everything else, due to the size of it. We were stoked. And when we finally got there, we waited another 15 minutes to get into the actual maze, but then we started our way through. The only thing we could all think, though, was... Wow, this is pretty lame, and it was very basic, at first anyway. A few hanging dolls, creepy music boxes, and some weak jump scares. But the further that you went, the scarier it got. 
They had trailers set throughout the maze that you'd go through and explore, and some of them were pretty gruesome, I'll admit. We finally understood, though, why there was a gore warning in the first place, and a need to know what you were allergic to, as we were sprayed with fake blood once or twice. Somewhere around halfway through the maze, though, a man in a striped sweater came out of the corn. I don't remember much about his costume outside of the dark hair and the black and the red striped sweater, but he followed us at a distance, didn't really say anything. It was definitely unsettling in a way that the other things hadn't been. There was a long distance between my group and the one that was allowed to go in after us, as they made people wait around 15 minutes between the groups to send them. We figured the guy would leave at some point, but it didn't stop us from checking over our shoulders constantly to see when or if he had. He didn't leave up until we hit an area with strobe lights, a sort of giant dumpster and a chain link fence set up on its own, sort of like a little maze. And right as we walked by the dumpster, another worker hopped out and began chasing us through the maze. But my friends and I ended up tripping and sort of piling over one another, and the employee was kind enough to sort of stop and help us up, then slowly walked us out of the chain link area. We walked a bit past it when the striped sweater dude was there again. He followed us all the way to the end through this sort of tunnel where the walls closed in on you at all sides, then disappeared as we hit the last batch of zombies, which included one of our friends that was unable to come that night. After getting through them, we walked to the exit and the sweater wearer was there again, but we had to actively walk past him this time instead of him being behind us, and I just remember a feeling of just pure dread as I got closer to this guy. Back when I was 13 too, I had very, very long hair. I hadn't cut it in like years and it was down past my hips. As I walked past this guy, he reached out and grabbed a fistful of my hair and yanked on it, knocking me backwards. My friends stopped when they heard me fall though and ran back to get me as they'd gotten a bit ahead of me. And the second that we started walking again, the man in the sweater grabbed my shirt and this time, I flipped out. I pushed his hand away and booked it out of there with my friends yelling at this guy. Later on, we were talking to our friends who worked there about it, asking if she knew who that was, as all employees meet up before their shifts in their designated employee area to find out where they'll be stationed for that shift. And when I did, she looked confused, and then told us that none of her co-workers at the maze wore striped shirts as it didn't fit in with any area of it, and all costumes are coordinated to specific areas. She said that she would look that night closer, but didn't see anyone that matched what we told her, and six years later, I still have no idea who that was, or what would have happened if my friends didn't hear me fall. When my ex and I first got together, we stayed at his dad's place out in the high desert of California. There's nothing really much out there but sand, drugs, and old people. His dad's place was a sort of sublet of types. There was a house and I guess what you might call apartments attached to it. The apartment had a living room, a bedroom. It had a kitchen and a bathroom too. All confined in a really tight space though. His dad was an older man in his 80s always slept on the couch and my ex said that that's just how it's always been too now i've been sensitive to things like ghosts and spirits and the like all my life my first experience being when i was less than a year old outside the church of my great uncle's funeral where i alerted my cousin who was holding me to his apparition on the other side of the street that's a story for another time for sure, but it's just always been like this for me, and I really don't know why. But anyway, that place just always made me nervous. I knew immediately that something was just wrong there, so wrong. In the bedroom, there was enough room for a queen-size bed, bedside tables on either side, and a large closet with one of those sliding doors. Since I was a child, I've always had a rule of keeping closet doors closed at night, there were places that I often saw things, especially ones that never walked this earth or were supposed to anyway. And I remember this one night specifically. 
I was laying in my bed with my ex and I suddenly felt a panic attack coming on. The weight in the room had shifted and there was just something there. And in the dark, the closet door was open. There was a reason for this and I'll circle back to that later, but I had always had issues sleeping there, especially near that closet. But that night I looked into the darkness and I saw something. My breath hiked up in my chest and my ex asked me what was it. I said, I see it, it lives in the closet, and I knew something had lived there, but this was the first time that it was letting me see it. My ex got really silent all of a sudden, and then he told me that he believed me, that he knew something terrible lived in that closet. How it had attached to his father, he doesn't know, but... He said that his dad, this man in his mid-80s, would burst in at like 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning and scream and wake him or us up if that closet door was closed. He would fling it back open, storm out and go back to the couch in the living room. And He had been doing this since they moved into this place. I think that's why he always slept on the couch, but what I saw was definitely not a human or even humanoid. It had teeth and sort of cat-like ears and eyes. I could see the teeth glistening through and they were yellow. It was smiling at me maybe. I observed it slowly, trying to breathe and see if it would tell me anything really, or what it wanted, who it was working for, how it came to be, just anything. I can usually get things to talk to me like that, but this thing continued to just stare and smile at me. I immediately got out of bed and I fled to my car outside. I began texting different friends to try and figure things out. I wanted to be told, was it going to hurt me? Was I in danger by staying there? Why had it shown itself to me now? My ex was screaming at me that if I play into it, that if I used pagan ways of handling it, that it would get worse. He was an orthodox Jew and he had his own beliefs, especially about mine. But I just started to refuse going there after this, refused staying there, refused pretty much everything in fact. My ex and I, we had a bit of a toxic relationship so it wasn't hard to cut ties to that house in the end which I'm actually grateful for. Months passed by and eventually he told me that his dad had suffered a major injury in this house. He had slipped and hit his head and hit his head so badly in fact that he was barely able to function now. It's sad, but his father will probably die alone in that house and with this thing in the closet. And there's not a thing anyone can or will do to save him. His daughter is trying to get him to move in with her, I believe, or was at least. I don't know, but my ex and I have not had contact over the last few months, but I believe that this thing in the closet is probably attached to him that it's been feeding off of him for so long that even if he does move, it'll come with him. I just really hope that whatever injury his brain sustained is enough to make him not too afraid, because perhaps that's a mercy. In the summer of 2016, during a summer camp, we went to Henry Cow Park in California to camp out. The day itself was normal, having fun throughout many activities. In my tent, I was with three of my friends. Uh, their names are Sam, Mark and Dave. We set up our tent in a small open area with a grove of trees. We were on the right side while the girls set up their tent on the left side. We had s'mores and we just sort of hung out and then we went to sleep. During the middle of the night, at about 12-ish, I heard something going through our bags, which were on the cable adjacent from our tent. Since it was late, I assumed that it was just an animal, like a raccoon or something, and so I just fell back to sleep. About 15 minutes later though, Dave woke me up, and he whispered to me, something's pressing up against the tent. I sort of lightly pressed my hand up against the side of the tent, and then something pressed it back. I was obviously frightened for a few seconds, then I chalked it up to be an animal once again, since we were obviously in the wilderness. We shook off the feeling and eventually we just sort of went back to sleep. I know, kids are pretty stupid, right? Anyway, 
I then woke up at six-ish and had to use the restroom. I opened the tent flap and was instantly greeted with the sight of some of our bags open and laying all over the floor. I exited the tent to investigate. I then thought about telling my bunkmates and I turned my head and the tent had flipped over onto its side. This was really strange because we had securely planted the stakes into the rings to hold down the tent. I then noticed that the stakes seemed to have been taken out. What was really strange though was that when we were asleep, we had not felt the tent flipping over. Confused and sort of worried, I woke everyone else up and they were unsure of what happened too. We set up the tent once again and went through our bags, but nothing from our bags was taken. So we just sort of went on with our day until it was breakfast time. We got our breakfast and went back down to our campsite. We sat down at the benches and tried to think of what caused the tent to flip over like that. I then explained what I heard and felt the previous night to my friends. That's when the girls approached our table and asked Sam, why were you snooping around our tent last night and why were you staring at us? We all explained that it wasn't any of us since none of us had exited the tent at any point. We explained what also happened to us last night and the girls were starting to freak out a bit. After a while of us trying to find a, some sort of a logical explanation for these events, we eventually came to the agreement that we had no idea what happened and to just try and forget that it never happened in the first place. My friends and I explained our experience to the counselors who couldn't come up with any explanation too. And I have explained this story to many of my friends we just have not been able to come up to a definitive answer on what might have happened that night. In February of 2013, I was dating my wife at the time. and We decided to take a trip to a resort on Lake Delavan in Wisconsin. The weather was cold, but not unusually so, and we thought that it would be a neat getaway. To set the stage, the place was pretty much deserted when we arrived. It's mostly a summer attraction for families from Illinois to come on vacation. There's a beach where you can go swimming and also a nearby golf course. People also frequently use the resort for weddings. However, when we were there, there was a thick layer of snow on the resort grounds and the lake was frozen over from months of sub-freezing temperatures. And not even Valentine's Day was enough to attract more than a handful of guests. We checked in and were directed to our room, which was about two-thirds of the way down a long deserted hallway. The hallway had a long line of rooms on the left side, which faced the lake. Walking to the room was kind of eerie because we passed an arcade that was completely deserted, and there was no sign of anyone else staying in that wing for the night. The hallway was also completely empty and silent. When we arrived at the room, it seemed nice enough and had a pretty view of the frozen over lake. There was one bed adjacent to the wall nearest the bathroom, which was on the right side when you entered the room. We decided to go out and walk on the ice. As my wife was from a warmer climate and had never done so before, we thought that it would be neat. And when we returned, the first strange thing happened. So as I opened the door to our room, I realized that I had left the light on. However, it abruptly turned off when we entered the room. It looked like one of those lights that has a timer and a motion sensor, so I dismissed it as just a coincidence. The rest of the evening was pretty uneventful. We went to dinner at the resort restaurant and had a couple of glasses of wine. We were pretty tired too by this time, so we ended up going to bed pretty early. And I must have woken up at around 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd say, with just a really uneasy feeling. The room felt like someone turned the heat off. As I shook off the fogginess of my sleep, I then noticed a figure standing next to the bed. My hair instantly stood up on end, and as I tried to make out what it was, I realized that it was a woman with dark hair and a light-colored dress who was sort of glowing. But before I could make out any more detail, she just sort of dissipated right in front of my eyes. I sort of rubbed my eyes a bit, and... I just sort of dismissed this as maybe a, a weird dream, a, a lucid dream. 
sleep paralysis maybe and eventually just drifted back to sleep but about an hour later I woke up again with that same feeling she was back however this time I was able to make out more detail she appeared to be Native American I would say and had braided hair with a light colored traditional dress I didn't get the sense that she wanted to harm me or anything she eventually dissipated again without saying anything or really moving but as I laid in bed, paralyzed by what I experienced, my wife abruptly sat up. Thinking that she was awake, I said, Honey, are you up? But got no response. Her eyes were still closed and she laid back down again. Later she told me that she didn't have any memory of doing this. I didn't get to sleep for a long time that night, but also didn't experience anything else after that, which I was grateful for. Next morning, we woke up and were laying in bed just talking. We hadn't been dating that long at that time and I was afraid of making her think that I was crazy by telling her what had happened. Finally though, I decided to do it and see if she remembered anything from the night before. And as I recounted my story, the lights on the headboard above us flickered on and off. They were turned off at that time too, so I found this to be very strange. Later that morning, we went into the bathroom and also noticed that the sink was on full blast. And neither of us recalled even using the sink that morning, let alone putting the sink on full blast like that. We checked out that day and asked the hotel receptionist, in passing, whether or not the resort had any reports of being haunted. I sort of expected them to laugh it off, but I instead got a very defensive vibe and denial from them. I later researched the lake and the resort and found out that the grounds were home to Native American burial mounds and was apparently known to be haunted. I had no idea that this was the case before we went. I even found a post discussing how staff reported seeing a woman in a white dress who would wander the halls of the resort. I can't help but wonder if that was the woman that I saw that night. I moved uh, a lot growing up. By the time freshman year of high school came around, I had moved seven or so times and was about a year and a half into my most recent move. I had found a pretty close group of friends in middle school and we all went to the high school together as well. But I met him through one of those close friends. They were in a band together and even though he was almost four years older than us, we welcomed him into our group. Sam was easily twice my size, tall and heavy set, and originally kind of intimidating, although I was never afraid of large men before him, lesson learned. But at the time, I had kind of a bad home life, and I spent as much time as I could at school, sometimes hanging around the school campus until 6 or 7 at night with this friend group. Three of us lived in the same direction, and we would walk the half an hour trip together until our path split. And one slightly colder evening, Sam offered to walk me home since the others had gone home already. I honestly thought that he was just being a gentleman. He mentioned something from a previous move when he lived in California. Apparently, he didn't walk a friend home and something horrible happened. He left it at that, and so I let him walk me home. We got a bit closer after that, too. We bonded over both living in California and exchanged numbers. He would message me late into the night about his depression and self-harm and I just wanted to help. But a few months later, he tried asking me out. It was this big romantic gesture because he learned a Disney song on the ukulele and sang it to me in the cafeteria. But I was already dating someone and when I turned him down, he got really angry. It was a sort of freaky, quiet, twitchy kind of angry too and I felt really bad. But it was at this time that I started seeing him everywhere. We were still friends and we still hung out in our groups, but I would pass him on the street walking somewhere and a few minutes later, I'd see that he'd changed directions and had started to follow me. He would walk me to my classes by following me in passing periods at a distance. I started to minimize the group time that we would spend together and he would follow me more. Eventually, I had friends meet me at each class and walk me to my next one because, well, I felt unsafe. I mean, he knew where I lived. And then he started to talk. 
Not to me, but to mutual friends about that one girl in California who he tried to walk home. At first, she just shared my name, some crazy coincidence. Then, she had the same brown curly hair and blue eyes, and every time he rambled about her, she became more and more like me. And then he said what happened. Over literal weeks, this fantasy evolved. They were walking home, and they were jumped by some guy with a knife. It was a robbery gone wrong on her birthday, January 24th, my birthday mind you, and she died horribly and he couldn't react in time. She apparently bled out in his arms. Sarah, who has brown curly hair, blue eyes, my name, my birthday, and sounds just like me, bled out in his arms. Each retelling added more and more detail though and this guy with his sick fantasy about my death would follow me around and knew where I lived. My boyfriend was abusive mentally and physically but I stayed as close to him as I could whenever I could because if the worst happened I knew for sure that at least he could throw a punch. I never felt safe at school or even in our little town especially walking home from school in the dark. One day though, at school, he had a huge breakdown, freaked out and ran out of school in a panic. I was sent after him and I found him curled up on the floor, I got closer. I knew about his anxiety and depression and my safety aside, I wanted to make sure that he was okay. And it was then that he told me this horrifying story that I'd been hearing from mutual friends with some added details. We'd been walking home from a concert in California. We passed a dark alley and a homeless man came out with a rusty knife and asked for anything valuable. I fumbled for my phone. I didn't have anything else on me and he thought that I was calling the cops. He stabbed me and once, twice, again and again and Sam just stood there horrified. He saw red and grabbed a broken glass bottle nearby my body and attacked this homeless guy. He killed him with his own knife and he told me that... He killed someone. My stalker had actually killed someone. It didn't matter how messed up he was anymore. I didn't care if it was just a fantasy or real. I didn't care how it would affect his mental health anymore. I needed to go to the police at this point. I was really scared for my life to be honest and my friends convinced me to go to the school counselor first. That morning we went and we told them everything. The stalking, the stories, how he admitted to murder and that that was the reason they moved from California, how I was afraid for my life and wanted to call the police. The counselor didn't take any of this seriously, mind you. She went to the principal and the principal, not a mental health expert, called Sam in to talk about the accusations. The principal then informed me that he didn't think that Sam had any kind of mental illness or that I was in any danger and that was that. It was at this point too that I pretty much lost faith in all adults, gave up on going to the police and I stayed with my friend walking me in between classes, hiding behind my abusive boyfriend and looking behind me every step of my walk home that year. The counsellors ended up gaslighting us to the point where this all feels like a fever dream now and I would think that it's made up if it weren't for my journal entries recording the events and my growing panic and also the similar stories from my friend group. But in the end, it was all sort of sorted out. It was a bit of a long process, but I eventually got out of there and, man, am I grateful that nothing ever came of it. Also, just to clarify some potential confusion, I don't actually think anyone actually died in California. I personally think that he's just a pathological liar and that he was so deep in a fantasy that he had convinced himself that it was real. No, I wasn't physically hurt, but... It was definitely emotionally scarring and the threat that he posed to me was definitely 100% real. And like I said, even if he is a liar, the fact that he had these fantasies is probably even more scary.